The goals of chapter seven are, know about the wave particle duality of the electron, know the different parts of a wave, amplitude, frequency, know about electromagnetic radiation and the electromagnetic spectrum, know the different models of the atom, know about excitation and emission, know how to determine the four quantum numbers of an electron, and finally, know how to write electron configuration of an element that is found in the periodic table. Let's begin our venture into chapter seven. Don't forget the homework problems that are listed here. Your homework problems may be different, dependent on the textbook. So chapter seven deals with the subatomic world, and the subatomic world basically does not comply with normal Newtonian physics, so the laws of motion are not valid. So we go through quantum mechanics or quantum theory. A condensation down to the most important elements of quantum theory relies upon one aspect of the behavior of an electron. And the electron behaves as both a wave and a particle. So you may think an electron is a particle that circulates and orbits around the nucleus of the atom, and you're correct. But then the electron also exhibits behavior of a wave. In order to understand this wave, we have to understand the different parts of a wave, such as wavelength, amplitude, and frequency. So the main point is that an electron has both wave behavior and particle behavior. We call that wave-particle duality. Another important aspect of quantum theory is that energy that we talked about in the previous chapter is actually quantized. It comes in discrete packets. So the energy, for example, to emit an electron is a certain value. If you exceed that value, that does not mean that the electron gets emitted. If you do not achieve that value, that means the electron is not emitted. You just need that right amount of energy, nothing more, nothing less, and then you will emit that electron. That is the nature of quantized. The energy comes in a very discrete amount in a very discrete packet. So here's a brief definition of the wave. It's actually a form of energy. So we talked in our previous chapter about energy and all the different manifestations. We mentioned briefly radiant energy, chemical energy, or solar energy, gravitational potential energy, and on and on we mentioned all these different types of energy. Well, within a wave, there's also energy within them. So let's dissect the parts of a wave. A wave travels. So its traveling is called frequency, how many times it passes a reference point. The units of, fre of frequency are going to be important. The units of frequency are one over second or inverse second. We also call inverse second or one over second the hertz. So the units of frequency are hertz, which is one over second. Now, you can imagine if a wave is traveling very, very fast, if it passes a reference point many, many, many times per second, then it will have a high frequency. Contrary to that, if a wave is traveling very slowly, if it passes some reference point a certain number of times that's very low per second, then we say the frequency is low. So a wave can travel high or it can uh, excuse me, a wave can travel fast or a wave length can travel slow. A wave that's traveling fast has a high frequency. A wave that's traveling slowly has a low frequency. The abbreviation of frequency is sometimes given as V, and it is a velocity. It is how fast. However, a wave doesn't travel from point A to B in a straight line. It travels from point A to point B as a wave, okay? So it is oscillatory. That oscillatory behavior contains within an energy and it contains with it a frequency. So let's take a look at two waves here. We have uh, all the behaviors of the wave. So from point uh, that is the highest point of this wave to the next highest point of the wave is the wavelength, right? The next lowest point of the wave to the next lowest point of the wave, that's called a wavelength. So this wavelength could be from high point to high point, crest to crest, or a low point to low point, trough to trough. And then the highest point the wave reach, reaches is an amplitude. 
I want to focus your attention on this blue smiley face. Pretend this blue smiley face is lying still. And this wave, as an oscillatory traveling piece of energy, passes this blue smiley face. All right, so the question that is asked here is, will it pass per time this blue happy face? Or will it pass this blue happy face more per time? And the answer is that this bottom wave actually uh, passes through this blue happy face faster. So this wave here at the bottom has a higher frequency. Remember our definition of frequency. Frequency is nothing more than how fast a wave travels. So the wave is traveling faster and passing through this blue happy, or happy face. This wave is traveling slower and it has uh, does not pass this blue happy face as much. There's a relationship between wavelength and frequency. So wavelength is from top to top or bottom to bottom. So look at this wavelength with a frequency that is this. And look at this wavelength here, okay, from top to top, which has a frequency of this. Now we've already established that this wave travels faster and passes this point this arbitrary point more than it does the above wave. But look and compare the wavelength versus the frequency, and we'll automatically see that the wavelength and frequency are an inverse proportion. They are an inverse function. So the larger the wavelength, the lower the frequency. The lower the wavelength, as shown at the bottom, the higher the frequency, the faster it travels. The electromagnetic spectrum is a series of waves at different wavelengths and frequencies. But it's not one wave, it's actually two waves that are traveling perpendicularly together. One wave is the electric field wave, and the other wave is the magnetic field wave. These are traveling at 90 degrees to one another. This E with an arrow over it represents a vector, so it's an electric field wave. And this B with the arrow over it represents a vector, it's a magnetic field wave. So the electromagnetic spectrum is a window that contains many different types of waves. It contains x-rays, it contains ultraviolet waves, it contains infrared waves, it contains waves that we can see, that is color. This is the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It contains microwave waves, etc., etc. So this is a whole window. It is a whole area. And housed within these areas are these different types of waves, each with their own frequencies, each with their own energies, each with their own wavelengths. So here we see um, James Maxwell's original propos proposition that the electromagnetic spectrum is a series of electric field waves, shown here in red. Traveling perpendicularly is magnetic field waves. So this is the E field wave. The magnetic field is the B field wave. They're traveling orthogonal to each other or perpendicularly to each other, and they're propagating through space. This has an energy. And this is how the electromagnetic spectrum is visualized. Electromagnetic spectrum waves travel at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. This is a very important constant to know and recognize, and possibly it would be good to memorize. It definitely would not hurt. And this is the relationship. Um, the wavelength times frequency is this velocity, V, the speed of the wave. But when you're talking about waves that are in the electromagnetic spectrum, these two perpendicularly fields, uh, then the wavelength times the frequency is the speed of light. So all waves in the electromagnetic spectrum essentially travel at the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So here are the different wavelengths, here are the different frequencies, and the type of radiation. Again, it's worth uh, reiterating that these travel at the speed of light, number one. And number two, these are E-field waves perpendicular to B-field waves that are being traversed through space. Once again, let me reiterate, these waves here travel at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and it is an electric field wave and a B field wave, each traveling mutually perpendicular to each other. When you have those two rules, then you're talking about energy in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have gamma rays. Notice here, very high frequency, very low wavelength. At the other extreme, we have radio waves, very, well, very low frequency, but a very, very large 10 to the 11th wavelength. So kind of 
you know, low power in this spectrum or in this region of the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, radio waves really cannot harm us or kill us in any way. And then at the other end, we have some very harmful and dangerous uh, radiation, gamma rays, very high frequency, very short wavelength. These can cause damage. Even at high enough doses, X-rays and UVs can cause, dam uh, can cause damage. If you look at a slither of the electromagnetic spectrum, we see, um, yeah, this is the visible region, Roy G. Bib. Red light is here, kind of low end on the energy left field. And then uh, we have violet, which is kind of on the high end, energetically speaking. By energy, I mean energy in joules. And so this slither right here is a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is what we can see. We really can't see these other um, energies or other um, waves of the electromagnetic spectrum, though we can use them. There's a tremendous amount of utility, whether we can hear them, such as the radio waves, uh, we use them, such as heat lamps, um, to warm our food. Um, sometimes we use these uh, to for hearing, so, so audio. Um, and then here's the visual visual region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then the sort of the diagnostic realm of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then sort of the very dangerous realm of the electromagnetic spectrum. It spans from 10 to the 4th hertz to 10 to the 20 hertz. So here's the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's actually white light. And when you take white light and pass it through a prism, you get all of this, uh, all of its different deconvoluted colors. Uh, Roy G. Bibb is the kind of the acronym that is used to discuss this. So each of these colors has an energy associated with them. Uh, the energy is kind of low for red, uh, but then as you go all the way to violet, the energy sort of increases. It's not energy that could really damage us. Um, this is the type of energy that sort of enters into our visual cortex system and our brain through our optic nerve processes them so that we see what we see. All right, a couple of other terms here. Um, this is used a lot in describing uh, quantum theory photons. This was Einstein's major work. Photons is just a fancy word for light particle. So if you actually bombard metals with a certain uh, uh, quanta of radiation, so there's that term again, quanta. If you bombard energy, uh, if, if you bombard a substance or a metal or any element with a quanta of energy, electrons can get emitted. So it's not an oversaturation, if you do too much energy, all the electrons are going to leave. No, it's just that amount and that amount only. Uh, if you exceed it, you don't get a release of an electron. So uh, there's a quanta, or also discrete energy packet. Hit a metal or any element with a quanta, and then you release photons. So these photons actually result, it's much more complicated than this, it actually results more as uh, electrons relaxing. When an electron relaxes, it releases energy, and that radiation can be in the form of photons. So we'll talk more about this uh, downstream in these lecture notes. So just as a reiteration, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength of a wave in the electromagnetic spectrum times the frequency of the wave in the electromagnetic spectrum. We usually designate wavelength in uh, nanometers, and um, we usually designate frequency in units of hertz. And then finally, another equation that's worth mentioning is energy. So uh, E is equal to HC over lambda. That is a derivation of a form of um, Planck's equation, um, where E is equal to HV. I want to bring your attention to this H. This H is Planck's constant. Okay, So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds is Planck's constant. Uh, no need to memorize it, uh, but it tells you that all of the electromagnetic spectrum, those regions, have an energy. It could be very high energy, such as gamma rays, which can have a detrimental effect on your health. It could be very low energy, such as the visible region, uh, which is an energy that your eye can see and process into a color. So let's do this practice problem here. The energy of a photon is 5.87 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. So 10 to the minus 20 joules, I mean, very tiny, tiny amount of energy. You can see Planck's constant here, H, uh, used in this equation, 6 times 
6 times 10 to the minus 34. Again, very, very small numbers. However, um, in the subatomic world, uh, this is magnificent, okay, because we're dealing with beneath the level of the atom. Looking at the answer, we'll utilize two equations here. The speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency, and E equals HV, and we'll substitute uh, for V, C over lambda. So here we have this equation, and um, solve for lambda, because the problem is asking for the wavelength in nanometers. And here is the wavelength, HC over E. Looking at everything in, be cognizant of your units. Uh, Planck's constant is this value, will be given. Um, speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That will be given also, though I would recommend you memorize it. And this is the energy, 5.87 times 10 to the minus 20 joules that was given in the problem. And putting all of that in my calculator, I get this value. Remember, wavelength is a length, so my units make sense. My units also cancel. Joule second at the numerator cancels out with joule seconds in the denominator. Left with meters, and I went ahead and just converted it to nanometers. In Bohr's depiction of the atom, we have certain energy states or energy levels. So an electron resides in an energy level. It could be energy level one, energy level two, energy level three. This is all within the atom. So it's important to understand that we're talking still within the atom and the electron is in the outer part of the atom and it resides in an energy level. So if you add a quanta of energy, if you add a quanta of energy, remember that's a very specific amount of energy, nothing more, nothing less, it can excite. So it's originally in the ground state, but when we add a quanta of energy, we excite it. So excitation to higher energy levels, relaxation back to ground state. Accompanying the relaxation bound back to ground state is emission. So that is the depiction of an atom according to Bohr. So here you see the energy levels. The electron it will be at energy level one. An electron can be an energy level two. It could be an energy level three. Notice that this is basically almost close to a century ago, his uh, Bohr's idea of an atom. This is what we call a model. And uh, in a model depiction, we are looking at the simplest way to explain complex phenomenon. And the idea is that the atom is a sphere and the electrons are in energy levels. When you relax, you see how this is going from n equals three energy level to n equals two energy level. It releases a photon, it emits a photon, or there's a certain emission of electromagnetic radiation. So here's the equation that talks about the energy involved in either excitation or relaxation. RH is the right word constant of 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. Again, notice J for joules, the unit of energy. And again, 10 to the minus 18, a very, very small energy uh, that we're referring to here in N is the principal quantum number. It's the energy level. So it could be going from energy level 1 to 2 and 1 to 3. It can also relax back down, so from 3 to 2, 3 to 1. When it relaxes or it emits in the emission spectrum, uh, the energy required is a release of energy. So basically, it's not an energy requirement. It's basically an energy emission. And excitation going from n equals 1 to n equals 2, or n equals 3 to n equals 5, or n equals 1 to n equals 6. All these going up in energy levels, excitation requires an input of energy. Again, for excitation, it's very important you recognize that this is a discrete energy level. Discrete energy packets, nothing more, nothing less. And then when you're going down in energy level, you're actually emitting. So there's a whole series of emission spectra uh, that is shown uh, down below in our notes. Okay, so here's a discharge spectrum. It's another term for an emission spectrum. If you excite hydrogen just enough, it can emit. And what is it emitting? It's emitting electromagnetic radiation. And what region of the electromagnetic spectrum is hydrogen emitting? It's emitting in the visible region because here you have energies, wavelengths, and frequencies in the violet, blue, violet, blue, green, and red region of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's worth noting that you can also excite with a quanta, and that electron, when it relaxes, can emit not just in the visible, but also in the infrared, 
the UV region, the microwave region, a um, lot of different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum uh, can emission occur. In fact, shown here are the names of some of these series. So going from energy level 7 back down to energy level 4, uh, from 6 to 4, from 5 to 4. So these are emissions. So we would expect energy to be released, the energy to be negative. That's called the bracket series. This is probably more so in the IR infrared region. We have the Paschkin series, again, along the lines of the IR or UV region that it's emitting. Again, these are relaxations, so we can expect energy to be emitted and that energy term to be negative in terms of joules. Remember, these are all energies. N equals, from N equals 3 to N equals 2, from N um, is another series of emissions. Again, it really depends on the element in the periodic table that uh, we are referring to. And then um, we have another series of emissions here. You go all the way as high as n equals 7 to n equals 1. That has a characteristic emission. Um, again, notice the down arrows. We are relaxing. The electron is going back to its ground state, the original state prior to the excitation via a quanta of energy. These arrows were pointing up. That is an energy that's required. That's an energy input. Now, this infinity sign basically simply means that the electron has been ejected or emitted from the atom. That is called the ionization energy, and it's very different than what we're talking about here. Uh, we're exciting the electron within the atom, within energy levels within the atom. Uh, there's another separate point where we can hit just with enough quanta of energy, and the electron is gone from the atom. It's completely liberated from the atom. The electron, cloud, everything associated with it is gone. And that's the ionization energy. That is not what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about uh, exciting an electron within energy levels uh, that uh, reside inside the atom. So here are different series. Notice here we're talking about hydrogen. And then the key word is emission, 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 emission. So uh, relaxation back to the ground state. All these different series, all these different discharge spectrums are in different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. For hydrogen, you saw a little bit of the visible uh, discharge spectrum in the figure above, but they can also go in the UV and IR region of the electromagnetic spectrum. All right, let's take a look at this exercise here. What is the wavelength in nanometers of a photon emitted during a transition of n equals 6 energy state? So that's its initial energy level. And its final energy level is n equals 4. So what is the energy involved? Well, it's not asking for the energy involved, but it's asking for the wavelength. So we can calculate the energy and from there get to the wavelength. All right, we'll use the Rydberg equation to solve this problem. Uh, the RH constant is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, 1 over the initial energy level minus 1 over the final energy level. The problem stipulates our initial energy level is 6 and our final energy level is 4. So let's plug those numbers into the denominator of this equation. And when we do that, our initial is 6, so 1 over 6 squared R final end level is 4, 1 over 4 squared. So we're going from 6 to 4. That's a relaxation. And uh, that's a relaxation that it means it's emission. So we are emitting, going back to the ground state. In this particular problem, the ground state is n equals 4. When I do all of this in my calculator, I get a change in energy of minus 7.57 times 10 to the minus 20 joules. The question asks for the wavelength. So the wavelength, uh, uh, most of these travel at the speed of light, if you're talking about a photon. Um, so we'll use this equation here, this version of Planck's constant. We know that uh, electromagnetic waves travel at the speed of light. So lambda V equals C. So doing that math here and plugging, plugging in all the terms, I get a value of 2,627 nanometers. So that's the wavelength of light that is emitted when a photon goes from n equals 4 to n equals, from n equals 6 to n equals 4. Remember, the energy sign is negative. The delta E is negative uh, because we are emitting, we're relaxing. Now comes the next level of maturation in our idea of the atom. So remember Bohr talked about the electron existing in 
energy levels, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on and so forth. Uh, if the energy level is n equals infinity, you have essentially kicked out the electron from the atom. But within the atom, the electron exists in energy levels. What de Broglie did was he came up with the idea that electrons reside in orbitals. So the fact that electrons are not particles that are circulating, remember at the very beginning of this lecture, you mentioned that electrons are not just particles, but they are waves as well. So to satisfy the attribute that electrons have wave-like properties with a wavelength and with a frequency, um, he said that electrons reside in orbitals. De Broglie said that. And he came up with the de Broglie equation. So the de Broglie equation is very fascinating because it tells us that for anything that has a momentum, there is a wave behavior associated with it. That if the wavelength behavior of an electron is Planck's constant divided by mass times u. Now this u is the velocity. And remember, electrons are moving, and an electron is a particle with mass, and we're essentially giving a particle with mass and solving a wavelength for it. So really, de Broglie is kind of merging or synergizing the two behaviors of an electron, the wavelength behavior of an electron, and the particle behavior of the electron. And it's all sort of enveloped in this equation. Once again, H is Planck's constant, n is the mass of an electron, and u is the velocity of the electron. This is velocity as in speed, as in meters per second or miles per hour. So let's do this practice problem here. Calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a tennis ball moving at 68 meters per second. And the mass of that tennis ball is 0.06 kilograms. Now remember what de Broglie's initial hypothesis was. Anything that's moving, so that would be your velocity v. And anything that is moving and has mass, so this particular tennis ball has a mass of 0.06 kilograms, has a wavelength behavior to it. Right? So that is the Broglie's initial supposition. So this problem is asking us to um, calculate the wavelength of a tennis ball moving. So we would never think of a tennis ball that's, you know, you're playing tennis. Uh, you cannot really think of a tennis ball that's, you know, in the tennis court as you're batting it with a tennis racket. That moving tennis ball having a wave-like property, more so than just having a wavelength. And de Broglie is saying it does have a wavelength. And then part B is comparing that wavelength associated with a moving tennis ball with the wavelength of a moving electron, the same speed, 68 meters per second. All right, remember de Broglie's supposition, anything with mass and is moving has a wavelength behavior to it. Now here's the mass of an electron, okay, 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So obviously here we have a dichotomy something that's 0.06 kilograms with this speed, and then something in the subatomic particle that's moving at the same speed, but is very, 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 very extremely, extremely um, light in terms of its weight. So let's plug it in and see the wavelength attributes of each of these moving particles, a moving tennis ball and a moving electron. So I plugged in this into the Broglie equation. H is Planck's constant. I um, fully derived the units of joule as kg's meters squared per second squared. So that's the full identity of the joule. And um, the mass is in kilograms. And then my um, velocity is going to be here, 68 meters per second. So plugging everything back into our de Broglie equation, uh, h is Planck's constant joules per second. Uh, but I sort of de uh, convoluted the joule into kg meter square per second square. So that's my joule, kg meter square per second square, joule times second. M is my mass, 0.060 kilograms, and this is my u velocity. Sometimes velocity is also called v, and it's moving at 68 meters per second. So uh, notice our mass is in kilograms. We do that to get our units to cancel out. So the kgs cancel, uh, the meter cancels out with this meter and the second cancels out with this second, and then another second cancels out with that second in the numerator, and we're left with units that are in meters, which is a wavelength. A wavelength is a length, and we're getting something that's 10 to the minus 34 meters. So when you're playing tennis and the ball is moving at 68 meters per second, um, 
It's really very little wave particle behavior associated to it. More of a particle behavior than a wave behavior. Now contrast that, the exact same equation, um, but this time it's not a tennis ball, it's an electron moving at the exact same speed. And when we do that, we have joules per second. Again, joule is kg's meter squared per second squared. And um, the units of Planck's constant are joules times second. This is the mass of the electron, and this is my velocity v, though in the equation it's listed as u as the variable. And we get something that's really on par uh, in terms of measurability. It's really on par in terms of being able to be um, quantified or detected by uh, chemical instruments. So the wavelength of 10 to the minus 5 meters, uh, that wave behavior um, is um, more wave-like than particle-like. So the electron has a lot of wave behavior besides particle behavior. Contrast 10 to the minus 34 is the wave behavior for a tennis ball versus 10 to the minus 5 as the wave behavior for an electron. Both are moving at the same speeds, and you begin to get the picture that in the subatomic world, things are more wave-like just as much as they are particle-like. Heisenberg's uncertainty principles basically states that we cannot know simultaneously the momentum of an electron and its position. So if we know the momentum of an electron, uh, then we sacrifice information on this position. Flip side, if we know everything about the position of an electron, then we sacrifice information knowing about its momentum. So it's a give or take. We know momentum, then we don't know where that electron is in its orbital. If we know the position of the electron, then we don't know where it's moving, uh, where at what density uh, is its highest place, because remember, most of these electrons, uh, there's a more of a probability distribution. The next section deals with quantum numbers. So this is an important section because it gives us the quote-unquote location of an electron. And now we're going to a third individual here who laid the landscape for our electron configuration and where electrons are around the nucleus of an atom, and that is Schrodinger. So Schrodinger thought of this more as a quantum mechanical treatment of the atom. And so he derived, along with Einstein and many others, Max Planck, um, sort of a quantum mechanical treatment. So it's a subatomic world with a new math. And Schrodinger, what he did was he took this orbital idea of de Broglie and he actually named these orbitals. Okay, He actually gave a shape, a distribution, some sort of a, um, abstract uh, characterization of these orbitals that these electrons reside in. So here you have your typical SPDNF. These are orbitals where electrons reside in, but more specifically, it's probabilities. So there's a lot of statistical mechanics. There's the probability of finding an electron in electron density space. So Schrodinger assigned an electron at quote unquote address of four quantum numbers. So this is how you define one electron. You define one electron by four numbers. One is n, the other is the quantum number l, the third is the quantum number m sub l, and the fourth is the quantum number m sub s. So the first quantum number n is very easy. It's the principal quantum number, and that is the basically the row in which the element is in. So the principal quantum number for the element hydrogen would be 1 because it's in row 1 of the periodic table, or period 1 of the periodic table. Lithium, if you were to find a address for the electrons in lithium, its principal quantum number for lithium would be 2 because it is in the second period or second row of the period. So like that, if you were to find the destination or the address of an electron in a certain element, look at the row or the period at which the element, that's the easiest quantum number. The other easiest quantum number is m sub s, the magnetic spin quantum number, and that could either be plus one half or minus one half. So either make it plus one half or minus one half. Let's go into detail about these middle two quantum numbers, L and M. All right, so just a reiteration, what are we doing? Where are we at? We're trying to find the quote unquote location of an electron. All right, so looking at your periodic table, you'll see that the atomic number 
gives you the number of protons and the number of electrons of the, of the neutral element. So we're going to take that electron and give it four quantum numbers. That is its quote-unquote address or quote-unquote location. All right, so n is the principal quantum number. We already talked about this. Our second quantum number is, m sub, is L. Excuse me. So this L is really takes on the shape of the orbital. All right, so L tells us whether we are S, we are P, we are D, or we are F. So <laughs> I direct you to this uh, small table that I made here that tells you uh, what L, the second principal quantum number, is. So if L is 0, then you're talking about, so if L is 0, you're talking about the S orbital. If L is 1, you're talking about the P orbital. If L is 2, you're talking about the D orbital. And we're really not going to go into the F, G, and H orbitals. But you probably want to memorize this. 0, L means S orbital. Uh, 1, L means the P orbital. And 2, L, L equals 2 means the D orbital. Now with L, we go to M sub L. And that's the magnetic quantum number. So you see here, S actually has different subshells, and P has different subshells, and D has different subshells in which the electrons can go in. So the S has a shape, P has a shape, D has a shape, but where do these electrons go? They go inside these orbital subshells, and those subshells are designated by M sub L. They take on minus L to plus L. So if you're in the S orbital, your L is going to be zero, your m sub l will also be zero because you only have one subshell. If you're in p and your l is p, that means you're in the p orbital, you have three subshells. So uh, the center is given zero. And so the three possible values of p are minus one, zero, and one. And then finally, d, um, it has five subshells. So with the center subshell being zero, the values of m sub l, the third quantum number for d orbitals, the electrons that reside there, are going to be minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. So that is um, the m sub l. And that is shown here in this table. So the name of the orbitals given by l where that electron resides in that orbital subshell can go or can be any one of these numbers. Right. So this is a table that would be good to memorize. Um, S has only one subshell, so the electron will either go spin up or spin down. P has three subshells for a total of six. So here in designation minus one, it will go spin up or spin down. In designation this one, zero, it can go spin up or spin down. And in designation this one, one, it can go and spin up or spin down. Okay, so two electrons here, one up, one down. Two electrons here, one up, one down. And two electrons here, one up and one down. Total of six electrons. Same thing here. Two electrons here, one up, one down. Two electrons here, one up, one down. Two electrons here, one up, one down. Two electrons here, one up, one down and two electrons here, one up, one down. Two electrons, four electrons, six electrons, eight electrons, ten electrons total housed in the d orbital. All right, and our fourth quantum number is spin quantum number. Very easy. This electron can either be spin up or spin down. Uh, the etiology of this comes from how these electrons behave underneath a magnetic field. So when an electron is placed in a magnetic field, it can either orient with the main magnetic field or orient against the, the main magnetic field. I'm not going to emphasize this terribly, but these are what's what the orbitals look like. L equals zero is the code for S, and this is the easiest orbital to, orbital to recognize or to visualize because um, it's just a sphere. So the probability of finding electron density in an S orbital approximates a sphere. For L equals 1, the P orbitals, so L equals 1, that's code for a P orbital. The electrons are residing in the P shell, and this would be uh, the electron density profile. It's sort of like a dumbbell shape along the X, Y, and Z axes, 
and you notice that center portion here where the two lobes meet, that's called a node, and that is an area where there's no electron density. Electron density is going to be in these uh, sort of dumbbells above and below uh, the node. So that is the shape of the p orbital, okay? the probability of finding an electron. And then finally, if L equals 2, that is the key code for an electron that's residing in the d orbital, and these are the shapes of the d orbitals. Notice there's five spots here, five subshells. There's three subshells in P, and there is only one subshell in S. This 1, 2, and 3 represents the principal quantum number, so 1S, principal quantum number 1, 2S, principal quantum number 2, 3s principal quantum number 3. So what's the principal quantum number for these guys? 2px, 2py, 2pz? The principal quantum number is going to be 2. And here we have 3ds, 3dx squared minus y squared, 3dz, uh, all the different 3d orbitals. The principal quantum number n is going to be 3 because this is a 3d orbital. All right, to get into practice on how to do quantum numbers, um, let us do this problem here. What are the four principal, excuse me, write the four quantum numbers for an electron in the 3p orbital. So let's go ahead and do that and check our answers. All right, so 3p orbital. So let's go back up here. This is for the 2p, um, but uh, 2p or 3p, they're just going up in one energy level. These are the shapes. Remember, these have um, subshells, so this is one subshell. An electron can go spin up or spin down. An electron here can go spin up or spin down. And an electron here can go spin up and spin down. So there's a total of six quantum number terms, and each of these terms has um, four values. A 3p orbital will tell us that our first quantum number, n, is going to be 3. So what is L? Okay, so it's a p orbital, and for a p orbital, L equals 1. So all of these guys, the second quantum number is going to be 1. So let's go back to this table here. We already got n, which is 3. We got L, because it's a 3p orbital, and p has an L of 1. And let's go up to this here. So the values of m sub L are going to be minus 1. 0, and then plus 1. So let's go back down here. This is our 3p orbital. Okay, just actually this is 2p, but 3p is going to be the same. It's just one energy level higher. So this is going to be minus 1. This is going to be 0, and this is going to be plus 1. So coming back down to our problem, these are the minus 1. This is the electron for the one that's in the minus 1 subshell, and it's spin down. This is the electron that's in the minus 1 subshell, but it's spin up. Here's the electron location for the one that's in the 0 subshell, spin up. Here's the electron position for the one that's in the 0 subshell, and it's spin minus 1 half. Here's the electron in the 1 subshell of the 3p orbital, it's spin down, minus 1 half. And here's the electron in the here's the electron in the plus one. Here's the electron in the plus one subshell of the three p orbital spin plus one half. All right, so minus one spin minus down and spin up. Zero spin up and spin down. Plus one spin down spin up. So write the four quantum numbers for an electron in a four d orbital. And this is how we'll approach that problem. What is our principal quantum number? It's 4. And what is L for a d orbital? Let's scroll back up here. L is equal to 2. So these are all our 4s, which are n. These are all our 2s, which designate the p orbital. So that's our second quantum number. Now, what values will the third quantum number, m sub L, take? So going back up to our table here, they can either be minus 2, spin up, spin down, minus 1, spin up, spin down, 0, spin up or spin down, 1, spin up or spin down, or 2, spin up or spin down. So let's go back down here. I got our minus 2s, and it's either spin down, spin up. Here are our minus 1s. It's either spin down or spin up. Here's our zeros. 
spin down and spin up. Here's our ones, spin down, spin up. And finally, here's our twos, spin down and spin up. So 10 electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and each electron has its own place with these four quantum numbers. All right, let's talk about electron configuration now. We already know our electron's location is designated by these four quantum numbers, N, L, M sub S, and M sub S. And now we're going to put our electrons into their own uh, orbital, and then we'll put them in their own shell, and then we'll put them in their own subshell. So a couple of rules in electron configuration. Number one, uh, we're going to go uh, by energy levels. The electrons will march from low energy to high energy. And no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. So if we go back up here to this problem, you see all of these sets of four are unique. This quantum number is unique to this quantum number. Everyone is unique. All of these 10 terms are unique. None of them are identical to the other. So every electron henceforth has its own address or personal place. So the electrons are going to go marching in, okay? The analogies to a football field, they're going to march in. They'll first march in at the 50-yard line, all the way to the outer bowls of the football arena, sort of the outer end. The space is, um, here we have the 1s orbital, so the electrons are going to go spin up and spin down. And then the third and fourth electrons will go spin up and spin down. Now, when it goes to the 2p orbital, remember the electrons are going in a specific order. Uh, they're going to not go and spin up, spin up, down. They're going to go spin up, spin up, spin up. And then they'll go spin down, spin down, and spin down, sort of completing the 2p orbital. All right, so that's the order in which they go in. This is called the off ball principle. And uh, that's just the designation of how electrons fill uh, the seats, if you want to take the football stadium analogy. Notice 1s has these first two quantum numbers. L is 0 for a um, s orbital. L is going to be 1 for a p orbital. Okay. If you're talking about a d orbital, L is going to be 2. So um, just some terminology here in our energy level diagram. So we are going to fill up electrons using the off bow principle. This whole thing is the shell. This is the 2 shell, shell L, N equals 2 energy level. Orbital is 2S. Orbital 2P has three subshells. Okay, remember, minus 1, 0, and 1 is going to be the M sub L, just like minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2 are going to be the subshells for the 3D and the 4D and the 5D orbital. Okay, no subshells for the s orbital, so m sub l is going to be zero, just like l is going to be zero. All right, so as we fill in these electrons, notice here we filled in eight electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we actually filled seven electrons, not eight. And notice how the electrons are being filled in the p orbital, all right? So the greatest number of parallel spins. This is an energetic minima. Uh, remember, the electrons are negatively charged, so they want to kind of get away from each other as best possible, while simultaneously uh, residing cozy and comfort comfortably in their orbitals. So that's why they do the spin up first, and then they'll do the spin down, uh, because there's no other choice. You, know, you don't want to go to a higher energy level. Uh, you can go spin down and sort of uh, fill up the 2p orbital. All right, the ordering of this, all right, so this is a nice diagram. Uh, so here are the orders of the energies. 1s would be the lowest energy. So obviously all the electrons are going to fill the 1s. Um, so here's the order in which they go, all right. So first, they'll fill in the 1s, so that will be 1s2. Then they'll fill in the 2s, so that's 2s2. And then they'll fill in the 2p. Remember, p has three subshells. Spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, and spin up, spin down. So that's a total of six. So that would be 2p6. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Then we fill the 3p. So that's 3p6. 4s2, 3d10. Remember, we can fill 10 electrons into 3d orbital. 4p6, 5s2, 
4D10, 5P6, 6S2, all right, 4F14, so these are the lanthanides on uh, the bottom of the periodic table, 5D10, 6P6, 7S2, 5F10, and 6D10, and then 7P6. So that is how the electrons are going to march. They're going to march in this order. Right? So basically, uh, off bow principle and Hun's rules tells us that we're going to fill them in. Um, we add them spin up first, and then we go spin down for the P, D, and F orbitals. Hun's rule for the S orbitals, it's always going to be spin down, spin down. Okay? I'll just write that here. Spin down, spin down. So that's how we fill our electrons for the s orbital. For E and D and F, remember, use Hund's rule and the off bow principle, fill all of them spin up. So here we have the condensed form of the electron configuration. I know it's very blurry, um, but uh, you can see here that um, they're using their nearest noble gas configurations, right? So we will talk about that uh, in just a few moments. So that's the condensed version. That is, you don't have to go on writing on and on and on lengths of orbitals and the orders in which they go, you can abridge it by putting in the electron configuration of the element's nearest noble gas. All right, there's an exception to the configuration for chromium and copper. This is worth noting. Um, I do go into a more thorough explanation of this in the lab that involves electron configuration, so please do check that out. Copper has 29 electrons, so it's gonna go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d9. That's for ordinary filling. So 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 6 is 10, 10 plus 2 is 12, 12 plus 6 is 18, 18 plus 2 is 20, 20 plus 9 is 29. So these, these are all our 29 electrons accounted for by copper. Remember, there's no ions here, so we're not giving any electrons or taking any electrons away. Right? And so each of these 29 electrons can be defined by four quantum numbers. 3d9 is, well, one electron is missing to become completely 3d10. And so what happens is that this happens spontaneously. It's sort of a self-promotion. One of the electrons from 4s2 goes to make this 3d10. And now what you have is a situation where the 3d orbital is completely full. And we say that in this sense, the 3d10 being completely full uh, and the 4s being half full is much more energetically stable than the 4s being completely full and the 3d having this weird situation where one electron is missing. So that is the electron configuration of copper. One electron is actually promoted to give you a full 3d orbital. So 2 plus 4, 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 6 is 10, 10 plus 2 is 12, and 12 plus 6 is 18. So what element in the periodic table is electrons? It's argon. So this is um, actually the electron configuration. I'll highlight it in green. This is the electron configuration for argon. And then 4s1 and 3d10 are the electrons for copper. So this is the full electron configuration. And the uh, condensed electron configuration is shown here where we use the nearest noble gas. All right, let's move on to chromium. So chromium is just like copper. This is the full electron configuration. 2 plus 2 is 4. 4 plus 6 is 10. 10 plus 2 is 12. 12 plus 6 is 18. 18 plus 2 is 20. 20 plus 4 is 24. So we've accounted for all 24 electrons in chromium. We fill them in all their orbitals, the 1s, 2s, 2p, and 3s orbitals. Uh, but this is not the right electron configuration for chromium. So what happens is that there's a self-promotion that occurs. So you notice 3D4, if one of the electrons actually goes and to the 3D shell, 3D orbital, it becomes 3D5. And that becomes a completely half-filled 3D orbital. And it just so turns out that a half-filled 3D orbital at 3D5 and a half-filled uh, S orbital at 4S is much, much more stable than a situation where you have four electrons and a completely filled S orbital. The electron just moves uh, and promotes itself to get a completely half-filled 3D orbital. 
So this promotion gives you a full 3D orbit. So the fully condensed electron configuration for this is 1s is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, 3d5. Okay, so that is its full electron configuration. The condensed form, um, again, as we stated before, this is the actually the electron configuration for argon. So I'll just make that red. And so uh, from here to here is the electron configuration of argon. 4s1, 3d5 is going to be the electron configuration of the remaining electrons that constitute chromium. So these are the elements that get promoted to a full d orbital. So copper, we just did the example. Below it in the periodic table is silver. Okay, so 5s1, 4d10, one of the s electrons goes to fully occupy the 4d orbital. And then we have gold, one of the s electrons. This is actually 6s1. Uh, one of the s electrons um, goes to fully occupy completely full fill the d orbital, the 5d orbital. And here we have electrons that are getting promoted to a half-filled d orbital. We did the example of chromium. Below that is molybdenum. So molybdenum, its nearest noble gas is krypton. One of the 5s electrons donates its electrons to completely half-fill the 4d orbital. And tungsten, w, um, its nearest uh, noble gas is argon. And uh, one of the S electrons from 6S donates its electrons to completely half fill the 5D orbital. So all of these are promotions to a completely half filled D orbital, much more stable than um, before. And all of these are promotions to a full D orbital, much more stable than before. So here's a high D guide of the periodic table and what orbitals the valence electrons are in. Valence is another term for outer electrons. So remember our order of filling, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, and then 4s. We go to 3d. Notice the principal quantum number for the d orbitals is n minus 1. That only is for the d side. That's only for the d, the transition metals. Then we go back to 4p, and then we fill 5s, and then n minus 1d. So it's the 4d electrons we fill. And then we get to the 5p electrons, then the 6s electrons, 5d, 6p. From 7s, we actually go to 4f. And then from 4f, we fill in the 6d electrons. Then from the 7, from 6d, we go to 7p. Right? There's also a branch from 7s to 5f. So from 7f, 7s, excuse me, we go to 5f, and then we fill the 6d and then we fill the 7p. I'm not going to, uh, at least for this class, uh, give you any problems involving uh, the lanthanides and the actinides. All right, so let's finish up this chapter with a practice problem, the ground state electronic configuration for a phosphorus. So I did not write the full extended state, uh, but I just know the nearest noble gas of phosphorus is neon, and then it's going to be 3s2, 3p3, all right? 3s2, 3p3. So right here is phosphorus. We fill in the 3s2 electrons, and then 1, 2, 3, there is phosphorus. All right. Its nearest noble gas is neon. And then p minus 3. So remember our section on ions? Minus 3 and anion means it has gained 3 electrons. So when it has gained 3 electrons, it uh, goes to the p orbital. So the new electron configuration is neon, it's nearest noble gas, 3s2, 3p6. But don't forget, 3s2, 3p6 is nothing more than argon. So argon is the electron configuration of p minus 3. Also neon, 3s2, 3p6 is the electron configuration of p minus 3. Argon and p minus 3 are what are called isoelectric. So these are two elements the ion form of P-3 and the noble gas argon have the same electron configuration.